Hey everyone, Noah Zerby here. In the late 1970s, a debate emerged within the realist approach to global politics. That debate would ultimately lead to the division of realism into two distinct camps, dubbed classical realism and neorealism. In response to the emergence of neorealism, a similar fracture took place within the liberal school of international relations as well, with neoliberal IR theory emerging. And that's the focus of this video. If the roots of neorealism can be traced back to Kenneth Waltz's 1979 book, Theory of International Politics, then the foundations of neoliberal international relations theory must be traced to two seminal works. The first was Robert Cohane's book, After Hegemony, Cooperation and Discord in the World Political Economy. Cohane, along with his later co-author Joseph Nye, developed the theory of complex interdependence to make sense of cooperation between states and global politics. The other was Robert Axelrod's book, The Evolution of Cooperation. Published in 1981, Axelrod's book shows how cooperation and coordination of strategy can evolve in the context of structural competition between actors. For more on this, see our video on The Prisoner's Dilemma and Its Solutions. What emerged from the work of Axelrod, Cohen, and others was the school of thought we now know as neoliberal international relations. While rooted in a similar optimistic outlook regarding the international system as classical liberalism, neoliberalism broke with classical liberalism in several important ways. First, and perhaps most importantly, while classical liberalism never really addressed the question of anarchy in the international system, neoliberalism accepted the realist proposition. That is, neoliberals agreed that the international system is anarchic, but nevertheless reject realist and neorealist assertions that this condition of anarchy would necessarily lead to conflict. Instead, neoliberals emphasize the centrality of cooperation in global politics. They asked an important question. If the anarchic international system necessarily creates a self-help environment, a war of all against all as Hobbes suggested, then why is war not more common? In answering that question, they emphasize the importance of international institutions in structuring the international environment in ways that mitigate against anarchy. Thus, while classical liberalism emphasized the centrality of human nature and argued that conflict was largely the result of bad actors or of the failure of cooperation, neoliberals accepted the realist assertion regarding the nature of the international system. Neoliberals accept that the international system is anarchic and that states will pursue the national interest. However, neoliberals assert that international institutions can help limit or shape that anarchy, help to set up the conditions under which cooperation may be more possible. Because of this, neoliberal IR theory is sometimes referred to as neoliberal institutionalism, a name that emphasizes the central importance neoliberals place on global institutions. Another important difference between classical and neoliberalism is rooted in the question of who are the most important actors in global politics. Classical liberalism tends to emphasize the importance of individual agents as actors in global politics. Individual choices and psychology tended to play an important role in classical liberal explanations and analyses. By contrast, neoliberalism tends to accept the realist assertion that the state is the most important actor, though they added international institutions essentially as collections of states as well. Neoliberals accepted the realist claim that the state was a rational actor, that it, is, it engaged in a cost-benefit analysis in pursuit of defined goals. Classical liberals would not necessarily be comfortable with this claim. And finally, classical liberals tended to be more historical and philosophical in their orientation, explaining conflict in specific historical contexts and drawing extensively on fields like political theory and philosophy. By contrast, neoliberal explanations of conflict tend to be more focused on ahistorical structural explanations and draw extensively from game theory and behavioral economics rather than history and philosophy in their analyses. Indeed, neoliberal thinkers often use concepts from game theory to show how the structure of the international system can force particular outcomes or can lead to situations where rational decision makers can make decisions which may appear to be rational, but which lead to suboptimal outcomes, a topic we cover in a different video. Neoliberalism can be thought of as having three dimensions. A social dimension, which holds that as people from different countries come into ever greater contact, they understand one another more and become less supportive of war. The opening of cultural expression and exchange and the discovery of shared values and beliefs reduces animosity between groups. 
This idea is not really very different from those expressed by classical liberalism. The second is an economic dimension. Neoliberalism stresses the importance of trade relations between countries for a couple of reasons. Politically, close economic ties between countries reduces the likelihood of conflict between them. To prevent conflict, neoliberalism emphasizes the importance of closer economic relations between states. Additionally, neoliberalism emphasizes the importance of free trade and of the market mechanism more generally as a powerful avenue for economic growth and development. Neoliberal economic theory argues that the state role should be relatively limited, that markets should play the dominant role in society. This is a point we'll come back to in greater detail when we discuss global political economy. And finally, neoliberalism has a political dimension that emphasizes the importance of international institutions in maintaining peace. Institutions like the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, and even organizations like the Universal Postal Union, according to neoliberals, play an absolutely vital role in global politics. We'll consider the role of international institutions in global politics in another video, but for now let's just briefly consider why neoliberal institutionalism places so much importance on the role of international organizations like the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, or others. For neoliberals, such institutions play a number of important roles in the global system. They encourage communication and dialogue between states, creating a forum for states to negotiate their differences. They promote transparency in interactions between states and in the agreements they negotiate. They help to shape expectations and to develop collective international norms that offer stability and predictability in global politics. They establish a framework to promote reciprocity and bargaining between states, facilitating the peaceful resolution of disputes. They permit coordination of policy to address tensions and collective action problems and thus help to avoid the security and prisoners' dilemmas. In short, international organizations can create processes and norms that facilitate cooperation and reduce tensions between states, mitigating the condition of anarchy in the international system. The idea of complex interdependence is also central to the neoliberal understanding of global politics. Developed in its current form by Robert Cohen and Joseph Nye, the idea of complex interdependence was articulated as part of their effort to make sense of the high degree of cooperation between states in the context of an anarchic international environment. Put simply, Cohen and Nye contrast dependence, which they see as the state of being determined or significantly affected by external forces, with interdependence, which they define as situations characterized by reciprocal effects among countries or among actors in different countries. In essence, while asymmetries of power may exist, each actor is able to influence the other. In developing their idea of complex interdependence, Cohen and Nye are responding to two developments in international politics, particularly since the 1970s. The first was a decline in direct military conflict and the use of force in international relations. The realist and neorealist assertion that the international system is a self-help environment should mean, according to Cohen and Nye, that states are concerned above all with their own survival and security. But in reality, cooperation rather than conflict seems to be more po common in global politics. More broadly, the growing importance of economic actors and issues raised questions about the centrality of power defined in terms of military force central to the realist understanding of IR. The European Union was growing in influence, the newly industrialized countries, most notably Japan, were developing as economic powerhouses without a corresponding growth in military capabilities. And the growing role of organizations like OPEC, the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries, testified to the increasing importance of economic rather than military power. All of these topics are addressed in greater detail in other videos. Cohen and Nye's complex interdependence, thus, is essentially an effort to explain this growing disconnect. Ironically, this situation was described by U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, a steadfast advocate of realpolitik and architect of U.S. policy in Vietnam, who observed in a 1974 speech to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council, Progress in dealing with our traditional agenda is no longer enough. A new and unprecedented kind of issue has emerged. The problems of energy, resources, environment, population, the uses of space in the seas, now rank with questions of military security, ideology, and territorial rivalry, which have traditionally made up the diplomatic agenda. There are three main elements or characteristics of complex interdependence. First, multiple channels connect societies. Relations between states are not simply a matter of government-to-government -government relations. 
Instead, societies are connected through their governments as well as through other avenues, including informal ties between non-governmental elites, relations between transnational corporations and local economies, connections across civil society, personal connections between private individuals, and a host of others. Second, the issues that states deal with are not simply or clearly organized in a hierarchy. Military security, in other words, is not always the state's number one objective. Economic, political, social, cultural, and other issues may dominate decision-making at a particular moment in time. As a result, states are constantly involved in trade-offs across policy issue areas at different moments. And third, military force is not always an effective vehicle through which to achieve policy objectives. As a result, the world has actually seen a decline in the use of military force and coercive power in international relations over time. Therefore, according to Kohane and Nye, states will often cooperate, negotiate across issue areas, and restrain themselves from the use of force in their foreign relations. In short, cooperation in global politics is not only possible, it's often effective. So that concludes our brief overview of neoliberal institutionalism or neoliberalism in international relations. Please leave any questions you have below, and thanks for watching. Bye.